Hi, I'm Ivana, founder at Cambridge Creation Lab. It is my utmost honor to speak yet again with one of my favorite people in the world, an artist, friend, teacher, Christopher Janney. Christopher is an American composer, artist, and architect known for his work on the interrelation of architecture and music. He grew up in Washington, DC and received a BA degree from Princeton University. And after graduation, he studied percussion and music in New York, performed jazz among other things, and worked with various artists and dance companies. He received an MS in environmental art at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His thesis under the great Otto Pini was titled Sound Stare, the nature of environmental participatory art. Christopher is a sculptor of sound, of colors, of light. He creates magic every day all around the world with his many installations and commissioned artworks. It's tough to talk about all his works in this chat. However, I wanted to get into his mind, which is very intriguing, about how he thinks of and makes and moves color in his mind. I have learned a lot from him and hope to continue this wonderful journey. Join me as we speak with Christopher Jenny. Hi, Christopher. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, good to see you again. Absolutely. Yeah, I love your studio space one more time. I don't see uh, the Shiva, Shiva installation, where is that? It's on it's, the, at that side, right? Uh, right? That side. There. Okay, so you change the position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There I see it. Yeah. yeah, I see that. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to jump into the questions. Um, yeah, very good. I'm sure people want to know what you're doing, but I also want to focus on the element of color in your, in your works because there is such a huge um, concentration, you know, of that. So okay. I'm going to talk we'll about... Yeah, okay. So some of my questions are going to be a little lengthy and tedious, but I just wanted to make, you know, make things sure. clear for people. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so we all know that sound is spatial and you being in, uh, from the architecture background, nobody better than you to say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, sound is energy. Um, mm -hmm. But when we take a closer look at your Fireflies installation, for example, Mm -hmm. There's a sonic analog here, a contrast between a uniform field of sound and one that is somewhat textured and a space mm -hmm. that is real and illusory at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the awareness of the physical space uh, arises in conjunction uh, with the perception of musical sounds in the activity of listening. So I know you have this beautiful combination of architecture, music, mm -hmm. um, but tell us more about how you conceived of this particular project and your experience working with the sounds and the space. Right, right, right. Um, right, Sonic Fireflies uh, was actually a commission for a big uh, entertainment center in Atlantic City. And uh, the space that they asked me to create a piece for had a big, beautiful glass wall that looked out over the Atlantic Ocean, the beach and the Atlantic Ocean. So um, uh, architecturally, you know, I, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if I could sort of do an upside down sonic forest hanging from the ceiling? That, that's sort of where I started. I mean, I knew I didn't worry about the reality of it in, in while I was sort of conceiving the idea. Um, but so then I had, you know, a talk with the developer and, and uh, uh, the contractors and they said, sure, you can have, you can hang anything from the ceiling that you want. Um, uh, so then I sort of began to develop models, 
how or how small could I make this sonic forest piece? You know, the sonic forest, uh, the original one is the columns are eight feet tall, they're 10 inches in diameter. Um, but we uh, got this down to about five inches in diameter by 12 inches tall inside a translucent white cylinder. Wow. Uh, so inside that cylinder, there was a, a nice Bose four inch satellite speaker, uh, a full color LED light and uh, an interactive sensor pointing straight down at the floor. So here it was, I'd shrunk Sonic Forest down to, you know, a, a sort of a little pendant. And I designed 64 of them to be over this space. Um, uh, and then so once I sort of had the physical form created and clarified uh, and approved uh, by the client, uh, I then began to think about, you know, the melodic and the environmental sounds that I would uh, have as you walk through this space. Obviously, these things would trigger as people walk through and with the speaker right over their head eight or nine feet off the floor. They'd hear, of course, the one that they triggered the loudest, but they'd hear all the others around them sort of in a very nice natural mix. Um, and I would sort of push the environmental sounds towards the aquatic life, ocean life, because that was the view. Um, I have to say a nice treat was that for the opening of this uh, facility, they had Beyonce. Uh, oh. Wow. And, it, and it was her first concert after she had given birth to her first child. And Atlantic City is, you know, uh, what, an hour or hour and a half from New York, mm -hmm. where she lived. So, uh, and they had built one of the, I think the biggest theater to date on the East Coast as part of this entertainment center. So um, they asked me if I would create a special score for the night that she performed there. And I said, well, ask Sony Music, her record company, if they'll send me the unmixed stems of her song, The End of Time, which is a song oh, that I yeah. knew, knew a lot and really loved. So uh, they worked that out. So I literally made a 64 speaker sound environment using parts of the unmixed tracks from that song and there's actually a short video of it on my website uh, that you can listen to and hear how I did it. So that was sort of a special treat, but a, a, a unique way to use this kind of 64 speaker environment in a space like that. Yeah, what I'm going to do is for listeners or viewers, you know, I'm going to put a link there for people to yeah. visit, the, visit, you know, and see the fireflies. I didn't see it in person. But just the whole concept is so beautiful, so intriguing. And uh, how long ago was this again, um, <laughs> this, this project? I think, uh, what do we were now? We're in 2021. I think it was around 2016, 17, something like that. Okay, okay. So it's not that, that old. No, 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 yeah. no. No, it used all the technology that I've been developing over the last 25 years how to make really uh, sort of rotable, I call them, you know, permanent architectural interactive sound installations. Uh, it's taken a long time, uh, but they definitely used a lot of the latest uh, inventions that I had created. Yeah, we don't get to talk about your um, work every day, but recently we get to talk about your work every day because my son unfailing, he's a heat fan. So he unfailingly mentions, you know, there is Christopher Gianni's installation there at the American right, right, Marina. Right. Yeah, and it's so right, beautiful. Right. It creates that, you know, even in the absence of people, you know, right. you see the colors light up and right. it, it's like we were there in the stadium twice and and the vibration of, of, the, of the sounds that they make at the background and your installation together, it creates nice. like a very flaming, heat environment nice. yeah it's nice. very beautiful nice nice so nice. we'll talk next about your harmonic fugue 
uh-huh. which has this spontaneous, ever changing color palette, as it right. were, right. Uh, where uh, participants form their own color codes. And as they walk through um, the artwork and they become color as it were. Right. And I wanted to know, first of all, what was the canvas that we, you worked with in your imagination? I know it's very hard for you to deconstruct everything. Sure, <laughs> and sure, sure, sure. How, do you, how do you superimpose colors? And this is, this is for the benefit of students who study art, you know? Sure, sure. And, sure. Uh, um, and if I may ask, what are the various associations that you formed in this particular project between colors and your own feelings as you worked on this project? Sure. Well, again, you know, when you're doing site specific work, um, just like in architecture, you know, you do a site analysis, you, you, you basically have to work with what's there. And uh, in this case, it was an underground, it was two, uh, two underground tunnels. Uh, they're each about 40 feet long, uh, uh, one right after the other. So you basically go in the tunnel, uh, it's under a highway. Uh, it's actually for the Hendricks College in oh. uh, Conway, Arkansas, and they were expanding their campus across the highway but they wanted to have something that would attract the students to go through the tunnel and not try to run across the highway. So, you know, there was a, there was a safety That's very clever. situation. Yeah. So I said, I'm your man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so, you know, you have these two tunnels and uh, raw concrete. Um, so light color, you know, light gray, which is good. So I, I immediately could see, okay, I can make, a very immersive color environment here. And also because of the concrete walls, it's very live, you know, it's like a cathedral. A lot of, a lot of vibration, a lot of echo. And so uh, that's very good for, like, for creating overlapping long tones, say in a pentatonic scale. Uh, so you can make this really nice immersive light and sound space, even in the day because the tunnels are essentially underground. So the daylight isn't washing out the color. Um, so, you know, I love, I love doing sites like that. Um, and so this was a, a, a great opportunity for me to do something that I thought a lot about and done temporary installations in other tunnels. Um, so in that sense, you know, making the color, uh, using the color palette and then also with the pentatonic scale, creating perfect fifths, perfect fourths, thirds, things that you know are very rich and very sort of stable, along with deep blues, uh, deep fuchsia, deep green. Not not so much hot colors like a yellow or an orange, but just keep it in the deep, the deep blues and the violet and the red in that area. So you know that's really just my personal palette of what I think about in terms of the relationship between color and sound, but also this idea that, you know, you're literally walking into the painting. You're walking through the yeah, painting. No. You're immersed in the color. You're not looking at the color. You are the painting. So, yeah. you know, it, it worked very, that kind of concept worked very well in this situation. Yeah. And it's strange that I haven't visited this installation either, but you know your website gives enough information and all the Google searches and the YouTube videos. You can feel it even from the videos, you know, and I quite can imagine that people walking through it, how they would feel. It's so therapeutic, it's so healing, you know, and yeah, I'm yeah, sure you yeah. felt that. I'm sure you- Yeah, yeah, well, that's always an important part of my work, doing, doing work in the public environment I'm always trying to make the space soothing and relaxing and really in counterpoint to the just sort of cacophony of the everyday world. So, uh, you know, and here you have students not necessarily running, but on their way from one place to another, trying to get to class or over to the gymnasium. So, you know, it worked very, 
it, you know, it runs 24 hours a day because, you know, students are up 24 hours a day. So uh, it works very well in sort of giving you a chill space on your way to and from uh, high stress situations. I think there should be one at MIT, right, too? Where oh, you are wouldn't from. that be great? That would be great. <laughs> Yeah, I think they need it because of the high stress level that they have there. Maybe in the yeah. in in lobby thirteen, yeah, somewhere. Well, yeah, lobby thir thirteen. Thirteen, <laughs> seven. You know, any yeah. of the big halls. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah. Coming to your installation, Sonic. But way. you know, but you yeah. uh -huh. you you can't teach somebody who doesn't want to learn. Yeah, that's true. So that's true. You know, I have to wait for MIT to say, "Oh, wouldn't this be a good idea?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know. It's I know. not that I haven't. It's not that I haven't suggested it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope they're listening to this. One of them. And Wouldn't that I, be nice? Yeah, that would be very nice. <laughs> so because I, I, I see the MIT students all the time. You know, now they sure, and sure. everything, but they do need that vibration, and the vibration is so beautiful at MIT. But the stress, especially in the in the in the uh, you know the testing times, you know, when they have sure. tests going on and exams, you know, they're, sure. they're just going to the sure. gym or yeah, lobby yeah. seven, you said, right? Lobby seven. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. yeah. So I'll come to your next installation, Sonic Rings. Yeah. And and I love I love the title so beautifully. Uh, nice, I great. I know that you you use colors and sounds and concentric rings, very Kandinskyan, uh, yet yes. with elements that Kandinsky only heard and touched via his synesthetic perceptibility. And he said, yeah. I'm going to read this. I yeah. applied streaks and blobs of colors into the canvas with a palette knife and I made them sing with all the intensity I could. So tell us about what led you through this process and why did you make it like concentric rings? What was the first sure. concept of sure. the idea? Sure. Well, first, let me just talk a little bit about how much I love Kandinsky and how much I feel such a connection with him. You know, he's really considered the father of abstract art. He was yeah. also, also a musician. Yeah. Uh, he created a very seminal performance piece called Yellow Sound. Yeah. Yeah. Which is uh, I think I have a, a wonderful, a wonderful merging of his ideas about color and performance. And he was also uh, an instrumental part of the Bauhaus as an educator. So I feel a great connection with him on many, many levels. Uh, with regard to Sonic Rings, that was for the London Olympics, 2012, oh. I think, right? Yeah. And um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. And so um, initially I, I thought like, well, you know, the Olympic rings, wouldn't it be nice to, okay, let's take Sonic Forest, the elements of Sonic Forest and put them in a series of concentric circles and mm -hmm. uh, and then write the score, write the music based on that. Let's put a series of benches both oh. in this at, at the center of the of the circles so that you can literally just sit there and listen to the sound moving around you. Uh, so oh, that was really the genesis uh, uh, of that particular piece. Um, but you know, from there, and it because it was in England, uh, you know, I I thought a lot about, of course, a lot of the music that's come out of the UK uh, and also Europe, and um, so the composition, it is a composition, it was a composition of both melodic and environmental sounds, but you know, having grown up with a lot of pop groups, the Beatles, the Who, the Clash. Um, I also sort of laid in some little snippets of them uh, as just little sound bites as part of the score. Oh, oh, wow. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, it would be, yeah. it'd be nice to do it again. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you're yeah. right. Kandinsky is a big inspiration. He's he's yeah has been a big inspiration and the Bauhaus, the entire Bauhaus philosophy really, but specifically Kandinsky and uh, you know a number of his paintings. He it's Composition Seven, Composition Eleven. So you know he's really trying to make a visual manifestation of music, uh, and uh, so you know he's he and I are very close. Uh, you, it might stray, it might sound strange, but eight years ago when I first visited your website, and uh -huh. I didn't know much about you, I just knew just a little Wikipedia information, and I visited right. your website. I didn't even click on any of the links that you have of your uh -huh. con of your installations. Uh -huh. I saw the overall color scheme, and I'm like, "Wow, this is so Kandinskyan." So that was nice, my first nice. reaction, you know, so the whole color palette, the whole sensation that you get just at the first sight of your website, you know, that, nice. uh, that's, that gives that impression. Nice, nice. <laughs> so um, for, uh, this brings me to your next work, which is uh, Chromatic Oasis. Right. Uh, rather than me describing it, you know, maybe faultily, uh, it would be nice to hear you share the birthing of the project and tell us why you call it um, the, the chromatic oasis. Right. Um, let's see. Well, now this was a, a commission for the Sacramento airport. Um, they were building a new international, this was uh, 2005 maybe, I think. They were building a new international wing and um it's right at the top you have to go up a series of escalators and then you're basically on the level where you begin your walk to go down to the gates and at the top there there's a huge skylight maybe 30, 40 feet by 40 feet and so they asked me if i would create a piece that would hang oh. uh in that skylight area and I said, okay, I want to change the color of the skylight. I don't want it to be uh, clear. I want it to be a rose color. And uh, then I'll design some kind of stable in, you know, Alexander Calder's ideas of just think, uh, mobiles that aren't moving. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll do it in transparent colored glass. Um, and so I really just started with that and creating, you know, cutting out and making sort of arcs, sections of circular forms. Um, and uh, if you look at the images of it, uh, they all, the circular forms center around a center point, but then actually each of the planes are tilted. Mm -hmm. And that was a big change so that it gave it much more th of a three-dimensional feel. It wasn't the, the glasses, the pieces of glass are not parallel, they're cocked. So that idea, and then again, you're walking underneath this colored glass with this colored glass skylight. So this notion that you're in this uh, frenetic and uh, place of cacophony of a rushing airport International Airport. So the notion of like, can I make an oasis here? Can I make a place where people will want to stop and just relax? And actually each in the glass, there's also a series of sensors that are pointing straight down. So as you walk underneath it, you're also triggering sound. And the sound score was, um, uh, has both melodic and environmental sounds, but it also has sounds of what is called the old Sacramento because Sacramento was a big uh, Western town. Um, and so you hear a lot of horses on cobblestone streets and you hear uh, uh, you know, a lot of cows uh, mooing and, and, and sort of a Western theme there. So I was very interested in sort of trying to create that idea of the sonic portrait of Sacramento, not just the present, but also the past. 
So how much time did you spend in the entire project? It must have taken long, right? Well, most of my projects take about a year. Yeah, you know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't take it takes maybe a month to actually d go through the design process. And then you have to begin to interface with the construction. Uh, but once I'm through the design process, yeah. then it's a matter of going back to it and refining it yeah. uh, over the, the next 10 or 11 months. Yeah. And then yeah. and, 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 and the nice thing about the sound part always is that um, you know, I go there with the score in mind. I don't have it finished because I need to hear what it sounds like in the space. And uh, but so then I really go there and I'm there. I stay there for like about two weeks and just listen to it and hopefully uh, listen to people walking underneath it in this case and how it triggers and you get a sense of what I call the diurnal rhythm of the airport. It's very busy, you know, in the morning, it's very busy at rush hour, and then it sort of uh, slows down. So I definitely make my scores so that they work over a day or a week or a month. Yeah, and is the Miami one still there? Your Miami? Uh, oh yeah, Miami, still there. My, my, Miami's there, and uh, we're now in discussion to do two or three more in, in the Miami airport and other places. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, it's been delayed because of COVID, but I actually have to go there next month uh, oh. to begin the discussions. I envy you, you can go to Florida. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I always try to time it for the winter. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the best time to go, right? It's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. you just come back feeling at least five years younger, you know? <laughs> no, no, it's, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 you know, I like, I like January, I like New England in January. It's cold, it's crisp. It doesn't tend to be very windy, so yeah. I like that. Yeah. Uh, but February, March, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, it gets a little dicey. So that's when I try to go south. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go to the last question. Um, and did, did you want to talk about invisible color? You had a question about that above. Um, did I? Yeah. D number D. Number D. Did I miss it? Oh yes, I missed invisible color. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm sliding through the questions, and I'm like, sure. I was just so sure. engrossed listening. I was sure, just thinking sure. of that. Yeah. So, in your words, I'm going to quote you. Uh, Invisible Color 2012, uh, Marcel Duchamp, how do you pronounce it? Yeah, Duchamp, French. Duchamp, yeah. Uh, once said, a title is an invisible color. Uh, my answer, sound is an invisible color. So began a series of works, and these are all your words, uh, in 2012 titled Invisible Color. The finished works each have a separate sound score exploring my idea of how sound influences visual perception. So mm -hmm. I know we spoke so many times about this, but I want to know the context, the particular context of this installation and how does the unity of the senses translate into the choreographic? I know you love dance and choreography and sure, rhythm, sure. you know, it's part sure. of almost your, your stream. Sure. Sure. So, so it's almost like a new form of um, consciousness that breeds a new architect. So sure. tell us about Invisible Color. I'm, thank, I'm, I'm so grateful you asked me about this. It's one of well, my... you know, I love talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I, know a great, I know a great deal about very little, but you're in the place where I know a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, I think um, you know, really the whole Invisible Color series was uh, because, you know, I made a number of installations and I really wanted to be, I really wanted to make a series of works that uh, embodied the concept mm. of what I do and what I think about. And this is an ongoing series. So, you know, I, I, I make two or three a year under, under the invisible color concept, but it really is this idea of, okay, here is um, a sculpture or a wall piece that allows me to really not have to be tied to a site-specific hmm. situation, 
mm. a commissioned work. I really can just, you know, have this pure work and really be able to work on and think about the relationships. You know, what does this visual form sound like? And what is the sound, what does this sonic form look like? I mean, you have to keep up your chops, you know, like any musician, so that, you know, when you, when you get a chance to perform, you basically know what you're doing. Now, the nice thing that happened was I did a big project in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, for a children's hospital there that opened in the fall of 2000. 18, I think, right? You told me about or, it. Or, or 2019, I think. And 2019, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I think so. So, so the Louisiana Arts and Science Museum offered me a retrospective um, in 2019, uh, which then co coincidentally or thankfully was scheduled to close March 1st, 2020, which is just when we got oh, into wow. COVID, when we got into COVID, it had been up for a year. But it, you know, I titled it Sound, uh, Sound is an Invisible Color. And uh, I got to show all these invisible color maquettes. You can see them on my website uh, as in, in one room all together. So that was wonderful. And uh, really what it's, what, what they allow me to do, I, I, I make these big, sculptures out of transparent colored resin, um, uh, you know, literally creating the forms. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I'm thinking about what the sound might be. Mm -hmm. And there's always a touch element to it where you literally touch some part of the piece and it triggers a sound score. So once I've made the, finished the final form, I then begin to compose what the sound score for it might be. And um, being able to have the six or eight pieces in the one room for this retrospective allowed me to also sort of make a whole sort of symphony. Hmm. You know, so all the pieces have uh, melodic sound, environmental sound. Some of them have clips of pieces of music like Miles Davis's song, Blue and Green. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things that were very influential in my work as a musician and also thinking about color in jazz, color in music. Um, so uh, in, in that sense, Invisible Color is really an ongoing, uh, an ongoing series of works that allows me to work outside the commissioned schedule and continue to develop my ideas. So you must have been very deeply influenced by Mondrian as well, right? Oh yeah, no, he was, he was a, big, a big person that I studied a lot in college. And Van Doesburg, which was part of the De Stijl group, also out of Holland at that time. Uh, but the whole neoplasticism, you know, what Mond Mondrian's idea was that, you know, color, has information just in and of itself. It doesn't have to be a picture of a cow to have the spirit of a cow. And uh, so of course he was uh, pretty influential. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the final question finally. Sure, sure. Um, and um, so we want to talk about uh, the innumerable light, color, touch, and sound-based installations. We all want to talk about it, but there's so much little time. And um, I want to ask, what is the, uh, the common language between them? Do you have a certain language? I know you were a percussionist at one time. And yeah. how does the sound of the drum uh, enhance your you know, senses? I know it does a lot. I went to two of your shows, so I know it is big, big. So what, and is that why dance is also an important part of your uh, uh, personal shows? Is that why it is? Well, everything I do is a combination of architecture and music. Mm -hmm. So when you, when I think about dance, dance is a way for me to, uh, be able to interact with physical space 
uh, in an artistic way. I mean, I create works for the public environment, uh, but then I create works specifically for the stage and specifically for dancers where I can explore very specific movements through space that trigger sound or trigger light. So that's why dance uh, is a big part of the performance side of my work. And certainly uh, being trained as a drummer and a percussionist, uh, it's really more about, you know, uh, the physical side of music. The drums is a very physical instrument. You, you hit something to make a sound. And um, so, you know, to me, the drums is the most architectural of all musical instruments. But that's, you know, other people might say piano or flute or whatever, but uh, in, in, the, in the physical sense of sound, drums has always been uh, something that has attracted me. And certainly when I then go and I do things with photoelectric sensors where you wave your hand or you touch something, that's still to me about being a drummer. You know, you're basically making some kind of physical gesture, which is generating a sound. So, and then, or, or, you know, the piece Sonic Shadow, where literally the, the, the dancer's entire body triggers sound. Their movement is actually making sound and making rhythmic patterns. So, you know, from, <laughs> from where I sit, it looks very obvious, but I understand I've been, I'm the only one over here. <laughs> and and I've, been, I've, I've been looking at it every day for now 50 years. Yeah. So, so I, I don't expect everybody to see it from my perspective. No, but I, I was also very deeply, my, my, uh, my family, they were, many of them were musicians and they all, uh -huh. all wanted me to sing. And I didn't have that, you know, Hindustani classical voice. And, uh -huh. and I was very conscious that I didn't have it. I was more into dance, but right, my good. first inspiration was always rhythm. It was all, right. I couldn't think or react with, without rhythm. And there were so many percussionists in my family, you know, playing right, the dangam, the tabla, you know, yeah, so good. that kind yeah. of like, even in my sleep, if there, a yeah. beat was missed, I would know, I would wake up and I'm like, sure. and sure. I think even in writing and imagining, sure. rhythm is so important. Sure, so, absolutely. So uh, do you have any particular message for students of art, you know, and who, who sometimes want to maybe study music or students of architecture who want to study music or music, sure. music students who sure. want to know a little bit of architecture, what can they do, sure. you know, sure. to sure. enhance their, their um, workspace or their projects? Well, I, I, I think, uh, I, I think first of all, for architecture students, you just have to be aware that you have five senses. And so you wanna to try to in, engage all five senses when you're designing a space, a building, a room. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Maybe what does it smell like? Can you touch certain parts of it? Uh, you know, certainly the kitchen has a lot of <laughs> haptic conditions. You're touching a lot of things all the time when you're working in a kitchen. Okay, so you want to be able to think about those things. Now, naturally, some senses are more dominant in certain spaces than in others. But I think it's important to, for students of architecture to have this awareness that, and, and you know, I mean, we're primarily a visual culture, which is uh, good and bad, meaning, yeah. you know, I mean, it, Francis Ford Coppola, the, the filmmaker says that, you know, 75% of my films are in the sound. And, you know, most people don't realize how much their ears are telling their eyes what they're looking at or exactly. where they're at. So uh, it, it is a condition where people aren't necessarily aware of it, students, but I think it's 
up to the student to explore and then find people who can help them explore it further. I mean, the, I, I, I would say there aren't a lot of architecture schools where they do pay enough attention to other senses besides the sense of sight. So that's one thing, certainly for students of music and, and certainly in the last 20 years, you know, with the inception of the computer as part of art, we have what's called physical computing, mm. which is how does, the, how does the computer interface with the real world mm. or, or how can it? So, you know, I mean, this, these, I didn't call it physical computing in 1977, but in hindsight, that's what I was doing. I was trying to think of ways or develop ways to put music into the architectural environment, into the public environment, public space, or just any space, really. So I think that music students have more opportunities now uh, to do things outside of the conservatory, outside of the classroom, um, outside of just uh, you know practicing their instrument uh, to play for a performance with an orchestra or a quartet or whatever it is. I think uh, you know. I think. It's, it's there. I, I don't know that a lot of faculty uh, emphasize this. I know more and more do. I mean, I have many people that I hire out of Berkeley College of Music and people that I hire out of MIT. So I have a good sense of, you know, that there's, there, there's more of a willingness, certainly, to integrate these kinds of things. But it, unless you take a specific course that's offered, uh, it doesn't tend to be emphasized as much as I think it should be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Especially, especially at the college level, because you know you're at the beginning of your life. Yeah. And and college is really one of the first places where you get to make your own decisions about what you study and mm. what you think about. Mm. Uh, so so it's it's a good place to really begin to get a sense of how broad a palette you can really work with. And, you know, if it doesn't interest you, it doesn't interest you. I mean, that, but, but I'm, I'm happy to say that it's much more available to students than it used to be. And, but it's really up to the student to make the leap. Yeah, in, in my humble opinion, you know, I think it may be started very early on in life by parents, you know, um, like even, for example, you know, just talking about your work, like if they are walking through the Miami airport, maybe, you know, just sure. talking about the space, being a part of it, you know, sure. and, and I'm sure reach in New York that sure. must sure. have had that. You know, so I'm going to put some videos in the in the Great. You know, Great. while while we are talking, so the videos yeah. show up. Yeah, Super. but yeah, so it was lovely talking to you, Christopher. Always, always yeah. nice. Yeah, and um, there's so much of information. I'm sure art students, music students, thinkers, designers have a lot to learn. And yes, can, and please yeah. email me info at jannysound.com. Yeah. Anybody who's interested in talking about these ideas, I'm, I'm uh, always happy to talk about the little area of what I know a lot about. Yeah, I'm going to put the link here in the in the in the video. Okay, so that super, yeah, so, so they can and also a link the link to your book. You know? Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and thank you for That's that great. gift. You know, I yes, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Well, for I, ho I hope we'll see each other face to face in 2021. Yeah. I say, I hope to see you in lobby 13. That's my favorite place yeah. to see you. <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. <laughs> Thank All right. you. Take Have care. Have a great day. You bye too. Bye. bye. In this section, I capture the movements of four dancers, each with a different sound. I then layer the sounds over one another as the performers create layered patterns of their own. Thank you.
Thank you.